Well, you guys get to put up with me for about 30 minutes. The first half is a lot of talking. The second half is more fun videos. So hang in there before the break. All right, so we'll be talking about training the core for athletic performance. So what exactly is the core? Well, there is no universally accepted definition, but most experts define it as the abdominals, the obliques, the transverse abdominis, multifidi, the pelvic floor, the diaphragm, the quadratus lumborum, the paraspinals, and the gluteals, and 29 muscles attached to the lumbar and the pelvic hip complex, and thus make up the core. Starting with the lumbar spine, we have the transversal spinalis group, which is made up of the rotatories, interspinalis, intertransversarii, semispinalis, and multifidus. This is the <coughs> deepest intrinsic muscle layer that provides proprioceptive information to the central nervous system and segmental stabilization. The next more superficial layer is the rectus spinae group, consisting of the iliocostalis, longissimus, and spinalis. Besides providing intersegmental stabilization, this group acts unilaterally to produce side flexion, bilaterally to produce trunk extension, and eccentrically to decelerate trunk flexion and rotation. Furthermore, we have the quadratus lumborum, which is a frontal plane stabilizer that assists with extension bilaterally, <coughs> side flexion unilaterally, and common works in conjunction with the glute med and the TFL. Latissimus dorsi is the bridge between the upper extremity and the core. Next we have the abdominals, which consists of the rectus abdominis, an important posture muscle that produces lumbar flexion, and the posterior pelvic tilt, the external obliques, which bilaterally flex the trunk, ipsilaterally side flex, and contralaterally rotate the trunk, the internal obliques, which ipsilaterally side flex and rotate the trunk and work in conjunction with that contralateral external oblique. And lastly, the transverse abdominis, which stabilizes the lumbar <laughs> spine and pelvis before movement and maintains intra-abdominal pressure. Together, the abdominals work to optimize spinal mechanics and provide sagittal, frontal, and transverse plane stabilization. The hip musculature involved in the core consists of the gluteals, <coughs> which act as frontal plane stabilizers of the pelvis. The psoas group also often gets attention when talking about the core as they work to balance lumbar shear forces and when overly shortened or tight, can lead to hyperlordosis, increasing stress and pressure on the lumbar vertebrae. <coughs> the hip musculature involved in the core consists of the gluteals, which act as frontal plane stabilizers of the pelvis. The psoas group is also what I just talked about. So next slide. All right. And lastly, we have the diaphragm, which also should be mentioned as it has to contract first prior to abdominal wall contraction to provide adequate stabilization to the spine. To early or too strong contraction of the abdominal wall prevents the diaphragm from descending properly and is therefore counterproductive in stabilizing the spine. So what are the primary roles of the core? The core stabilizes the body in all three planes. It provides proximal stability to allow for lower quadrant mobility and likewise distal stability to allow for upper quadrant mobility in addition to allowing both quadrants to move efficiently. The core controls the position and motion of the trunk over the pelvis and lower extremities. It serves as the link between the upper and lower quadrants allowing for transfer of power between the different segments. And lastly, the core muscles create stiffness to stabilize and protect the spine. In fact, the osteoligamentous lumbar spine buckles under compressive loads of only about 20 pounds, thus emphasizing the importance of our core musculature preventing this collapse by compressing and stiffening the spine, thus enhancing stability. Core stability and core strength are often terms that get used interchangeably. Core stability is the ability of the core to resist unwanted movement through activation of the core as a whole. Core strength is the amount of force the core can produce to perform a desired movement. The lumbar spine does allow for movement in all three planes, but overall is quite limited. It can move the most through flexion and extension, but we know from experience to avoid repetition, prolonged periods, and high loads when going into these extremes. Rotation at the lumbar spine contributes to only about 13% of total spine rotation, and lateral flexion from L1 to S1 is about 27 degrees, while thora the thoracic spine contributes up to about 75 degrees, suggesting that the lumbar spine is built more for stability than mobility. A good majority of patients are placed on a core stability program in which they are trained to resist unwanted motion at the lumbar spine, and it may not be necessary to advance far beyond this. However, many athletes do need to progress beyond core stability into functional core strength in order to train motion through the hips and thoracic spine while properly demonstrating core control. Rotational athletes, for example, would uh, benefit from incorporating multiplanar and rotational movements similar to the motions of their sport. 
A recent study found baseball players who added two medicine ball core exercises, one being rotational into their training regimen, demonstrated improved angular hip and shoulder velocity, torso rotational strength, and linear bat and speed when compared to their teammates who completed the exact same sport specific and strength training regimen excluding these two <coughs> exercises, suggesting the importance of sport specificity with core strengthening, which also may enhance performance and can also help with some buy-in with our exercise programs. It's important to remember that inadequate mobility can lead to inadequate stabilization of the lumbar spine. Phase one of your core program may be addressing joint or soft tissue mobility impairments. Tight hip flexors or rectus spinae, often paired with weakness in the glutes and abdominals, often creates a forced couple, resulting in an anterior pelvic tilt and increased lumbar extension strain. In order to work on core stability into a neutral spine, obviously you need to be able to get there. You need the appropriate mobility. Another important point to stress is teaching our patients how to stretch in neutral pelvis, not only to achieve a better stretch, but to also reduce excess stress and strain to the spine. You can see an example here, we have two hip flexor stretches. Uh, the one gal is, on, is, is in a nice neutral spine. The other one that we commonly see is causing so much extra stress on that lumbar spine. Another example of why we do like to also stretch the hamstrings and the supine, the very strong muscle groups. You can see the pelvis and the long seated stretch. And uh, quadriceps stretches too are often performed with a lot of extra stress on this, the spine with a lot of hyperlordosis. Objectively documenting core strength and thus one's improvement over time and limited normative data creates barriers when attempting to correlate core strength to injury prevention or sport performance. There are a few tests out there that can assist with objective data such as the abdominal neuromuscular control test and the bilateral lower leg lowering test, both which have the patient in 90 degrees of hip flexion, either with their knees in 90 degrees of flexion or fully extended. These tests then require the patient to maintain that neutral pelvis, which you can assess with your hand or even a blood pressure cuff, and then you can have them slowly lower back down to the treatment table. You can then record at what hip flexion angle neutral pelvis is compromised. I like the bilateral lower leg lowering test because it does have set categories out there as normal, good, fair, or poor, and you can definitely use this with writing goals. Furthermore, we do have timed plank tests assessing core stability. It is crucial with these tests, however, that the rater is able to identify, compromise a form, and stop the test when this occurs. You can have your hand right on the lumbar spine, or I even like to sometimes use a bubble inclinometer, in which you shouldn't see that move more than 10 degrees to assess uh, lumbar extension with fatigue. And thankfully, we are starting to see normative data for the prone and side plank tests for males and females, which you can see on this slide. Another test option is the extension endurance test, which also does have normative data published. And lastly, there is a unilateral bridge test, which was actually found to correlate with lab biomechanical measures of core stability. However, it's just limited with normative data right now. These tests, however, do have critics as they are you know, mainly in an isometric contraction, therefore not very functional to the athlete. If you're hoping to evaluate the core in a more functional position, Kilbert et al. has documented a series of functional tests on multiple planes of motion. These tests consist of assessing movement in the sagittal, frontal, and transverse planes by having the athlete stand in a bilateral or unilateral stance and move in uh, either plane targeting knee-centric core control. You can read the specifics further on this slide if this interests you. I do find these to be more of a functional movement screen. However, the single leg squat test is included, which we know is valid for assessment of hip and core deficits. Assessing the sport specific movement pattern of your athletes is very important. It's very common to see good core strength in the clinic, however a disconnect when carrying this over to sport specific movement patterns. Don't forget the amount of motor learning required to make this connection. An example I like uses distance runners, you can progress their core strength and stability to, to a very high level and even prove it through dynamometer strength and functional assessments. However, if you just turn this runner back to their sport with no sport specific training, you may not be setting them up for the greatest amount of success. Most, and this has been published, will demonstrate no difference on a running analysis, whether it be hip drop, trunk leaning, or excessive anterior pelvic tilting, even though demonstrating substantial improvements clinically. 
Many athletes need to be instructed how to change their form and how to incorporate their strength. It just won't happen. There's actually multiple running studies out there that state you need six weeks to teach them how to run with this new form. Another good example is as simple as training female athletes how to appropriately cut and pivot without trunk leaning once they do have that adequate core strength. You're going to have to teach them how to use that strength. So what has the literature found in regards to core strength? Well, we know that uninjured male and females have greater hip abductor and external rotation strength. They can hold side planks longer and demonstrate higher back extensor endurance when compared to injured controls. We also know that trunk displacement through lateral leaning with side cutting is greater in athletes with knee ligament injuries compared to healthy controls and has been found to be one of the strongest predictors of injury risk in some studies. A systematic review found four different core targeted rehab protocols alleviated low back pain and lumbar stabilization, specifically improved function. And lastly, six weeks of core strengthening in recreational competitive runners resulted in faster 5K race times in addition to a significant correlation between the total core strength and the 40 and 20 yard dash as well as the shuttle run and division one football players. These findings again suggest a correlation between core strength and performance. So before we get into the exercise selection, what should we avoid? Well, repetitive flexion with very little load can predispose one to disc herniations with increased loads reducing the amount of flexion cycles required to sustain a herniation. Therefore, traditional sit-ups, which impose high loads of compression on the spine, are avoided and replaced by a partial crunch with about 3 degrees of flexion versus 30, or better yet, a prone plank, which is targeting more core muscles and demonstrating similar abdominal and increased oblique EMG. We know through trials at all that soldiers who train for the traditional sit-up sit test by implementing planks into their training not only performed better on the traditional test, but had healthier spines. As the spine extends, the set joints and parts interarticulares are loaded and the interspinous ligaments compressed. Not surprisingly, repetitive spine extension cycles can cause a fatigue fracture leading to a spondylolisthesis. And range extension exercises, commonly known as supermans, can result in over 6,000 newtons of compression on a hyperextended spine. And seated back extension exercises, such as the Roman chair, can cause excessive compression. Some believe that the extensor muscles are designed more for muscular endurance and to exercise caution when trying to train them for strength. Research has further shown that all of the extensor muscles are important, not just one. The bird dog exercise can be used to train the extensor muscles while maintaining a neutral spine with low spine penalty when done correctly. Rotation or twisting of the spine can cause facet compression and affects the load bearing ability of the discs when they are placed in this weakened position, resulting in greater spinal compression. All twisting or rotational exercises must be considered with caution. Seated rotation machines can create high compressive forces. Popular belief is that in order to train the obliques, we have to twist. The obliques and the quadrus, quadratus lumborum, for that matter, are supremely trained with side planks. The spine is held in a neutral position to decrease the likelihood of tissue overload. There are many variations of the side plank to train the obliques and preserve the spine. A rotating plank, which we'll show you later, <coughs> rotates through the hips and not the spine and is actually an excellent choice for training functional rotation. The best core programs, whether for rehab, general fitness, or performance enhancement, should focus on training the appropriate muscle groups while avoiding penalty to the spine. Patient-specific factors need to be addressed, and rarely is this a one-size-fits-all program. After adequate mobility is determined, stability is incorporated, progressing to strength and power development based on your patient's tolerance and functional demands. Core stability actually begins at the level of the diaphragm. As mentioned previously, it has to contract prior to the abdominal wall to properly descend and therefore stabilize the spine. Multiple studies have identified individuals with limited capacity to contract the diaphragm have a higher risk of developing back pain. The diaphragm's respiratory function can be assessed in a seated or supine position by placing the fingers at the lower rib cage and feeling for that lateral expansion as well as activation of the posterior lateral abdominal wall. An upward or inward movement of the rib cage is a sign of dysfunctional breathing. Next, go ahead and instruct your patient to pressurize all the way down to the lower abdominal cavity while maximum exhaling and briefly holding the breath. You should be able to feel the pressure against a hand placed in the lower abdomen. Then instruct the patient to maintain that pressure while going through normal breathing cycles. This is how you know if the diaphragm is now performing its breathing function at a lower position. 
Next up is teaching abdominal bracing, which now we know to recruit all the abdominal muscles to find and maintain that neutral pelvis. This is an important step that will serve as the foundation of your core program and it should not be overlooked. Many patients, and even athletes for that matter, do have poor body awareness and actually will struggle to abdominally brace and hold neutral. Starting in supine accessibility of your patient to engage the core and maintain neutral with simple movement. If it's too easy, then progress to advanced positions. This assessment will help you decide the entry level of your core program. Typically, core programs will start in supine before they will progress to quadruped, before prone, sideline before kneeling, and then standing before walking, and then lastly, functional specific motions. The exercise selection for this presentation considered entire core EMG activity and resulting spinal compression with the goal of creating the greatest amount of stability with reduced penalty to the spine. All of these exercises should be completed in neutral pelvis and stopped when form is compromised. We will start with a routine that does not require equipment at a beginner's level. Brandon, how do you play this video here? Did I just click on it? I just, I just did. Okay. Starting in supine, we have these dead bugs here. They teach resistance to lumbar extension and can be progressed to incorporating marching or offset arm and leg movements, as you see here. One step further would be uh, bilaterally moving offset arm and leg. You just want to really watch for hyperlordosis, which is common with that advancement. Before you even start, you're abdominally bracing, you're finding that neutral pelvis, and you're maintaining it throughout, you're stopping if it's compromised. I'll let you play that one, Brandon. Here we have our partial crunch. We will do this with three degrees of flexion versus 30. And we'll move on to bridging. Bridging results in low compressive load and demonstrates high recruitment of the lumbar multifidi in addition to activating the hamstrings and glutes. You can advance the arm position with just standard bridges as well. Moving into prone, we do have the plank, which is an anti-extension stability exercise. It can be started on the, the knees or toes, and it can be held isometrically. This activates all the core musculature when done with abdominal bracing and should be performed in that neutral pelvis, which in turn activates the glutes. Furthermore, we have side planks, which can also be started on the knees or toes, teaching stability against lateral flexion, while firing the quadratus lumborum and obliques. <clears throat> Advanced different arm positions, you can go to the toes. I do allow, allow a little rotation of that top hip downward to better facilitate that bottom oblique. You can advance the arm position. Quadruped exercises are next with the bird dog, a great exercise to activate the posture musculature ensuring appropriate abdominal bracing and that neutral pelvis while working to single arm movements. Others such as low and high bear crawls or anti-extension progressions. They're basically just making sure they're staying out of that ex excessive extension throughout the lumbar spine. Other beginning core exercises can be incorporated utilizing a Swiss or physio ball when it comes to using, using equipment for a core program. We actually do like the Swiss ball because it's easily accessible, but also has been found to be very effective in enhancing core strength in as little as six weeks. In supine, we do have the partial crunch, which when performed on the ball, demonstrates increased oblique and abdominal activity. We have the reverse crunch performed with the ball in which you will then demonstrate half the disc pressure when compared to a regular sit-up, and you will also then also be activating the uh, hamstrings. Bridging with the feet on the ball compared to a bench increases trunk flexor and extensor EMG activity. So basically you're looking for that straight line pretty much from the shoulders to the ankle there. Furthermore, bridging with the back on the ball is a challenging exercise. They might need upper extremity support initially. You can advance arm placement. You can add weights to the upper extremities too. Quadruped here, we have an uh, exercise performed over the ball. The bird dog actually, which will unload the spine more when compared to regular quadruped. 
So again, if you need to unload that spine, performing it over the ball is a, is a very good option versus without the ball. Side planks can be incorporated on a ball, which will further challenge your muscular control. I tend to add a ball more to the upper extremity than the lower extremities. With core, I think it just better facilitates the core in general. Furthermore, we have seated marching on a ball, which will challenge your muscular control, especially when you're making a, a maintaining that neutral alignment. This is a fun one to add in, throwing in catching, even kicking exercises. Having to maintain neutral, you can even do perturbations on the ball. Next, we have our intermediate phase. Starting with no equipment, we have bridging, which demonstrates low spinal compression when performed bilaterally again. Unilateral bridging can increase lumbar compression to high levels and should be approached with caution. I tend to use the march as you see here instead of that straight leg raise position when attempting to progress to unilateral. You can further isolate the ab or adductors, which you see here with the weight having to hold a, uh, a weight there. Pro planks can be advanced to toes, increasing hold time and starting single arm or leg walkouts. I allow a little elevation with the hips. Uh, I, if you're a neutral pelvis, if you're properly abdominally bracing, I actually think you're working the core more doing that. So there should be really no movement in the hips. Side planks, again, can be advanced to toes with increased hold time and working in pulses, which you'll see here. <coughs> or you can even now advance arm position. Quadruped can be advanced. However, know that single leg extensions in quadruped can create low uh, lumbar compressive forces. However, when raising that opposite arm and leg simultaneously, compressive forces will increase by nearly 1,000 newtons to a moderate level. As previously mentioned, patients with low back pain or post-surgery may never work into this adva advancement or you may need to utilize the physio ball. Furthermore, we can progress into kneeling or standing postures by using bands or cables for fallout exercises, which are a great anti-extension progression. Chops and half kneeling can be incorporated for further anti-rotation training. Isometric holds are in and out with the paloff press. Progressing to split stance is another great anti-rotation exercise. Moving on to the intermediate level with the Swiss ball. In supine, we have the double crunch. You can also advance bridging to having the back on the ball and incorporate an ab or adduction. You can see abduction here with the band. You can also increase the resistance, which you'll see here soon. You can advance the arm placement, add upper extremity weights. You can do a plate or a dumbbell at the hips to add resistance to this. And then eventually you can progress to just holding that weight above too. Furthermore, bridging with the feet on the ball can be advanced by performing a dynamic motions. This is also a great hamstring exercise. And you can alternate those straight leg raises. It should be a nice straight line from the ankles to the shoulder. In prone, we do have rollouts that can be incorporated. Uh, they're a great exercise requiring strong abdominal control. You do not need much movement uh, for a rollout here. Start with the knees. You can progress to toes here. And again, you will not need much motion. Further advancement with this would be getting lower or going further. Walkouts on the wall are another great anti-extension exercise in which, the, in which when you add the leg extensions here, you can really facilitate trunk flexors and extensors and increase oblique and abdominal activity, so working the majority of that core. 
This exercise, as you can see, also really works the posterior chain to include the glutes and hamstrings, not to mention the upper extremity facilitation that's occurring. Planks can also be done on the ball in a prone. Here you're incorporating the leg lifts or single leg walkouts. Side planks can advance arm position. You'll see the ball is actually up against the wall there and it's still a very challenging exercise or you can incorporate those rotations. Furthermore, bird dogs and quadruped with alternating arm and leg extensions over the wall can be progressed more safely due to decreased spinal loading. A little compromise of form here. We will blame our assistant Danette for this as once we got through recording phase two of core, she uh, let me know so kindly that she didn't actually record it. So we had to go through it again. <laughs> Next up we have the advanced phase. In supine, bridging can be cautiously advanced to unilateral or resistance can be added for a hip thruster exercise or even uh, advanced glute strength with a hip thruster. Again, you're putting more compression on the spine here, so you gotta be cautious with it. In prone, planks are advanced to the simultaneous opposite arm and leg motions. Here you will see <coughs> some rotating planks. And side planks are progressed. Here you can see uh, we have the leg lifts, arm position advancement, hip should stay high. Again, I allow that top hip to slightly rotate down to get the bottom oblique more. And then another one is uh, threading the needle, teaching rotation through the thoracic spine and the hips, maintaining neutral pelvis. In quadruped, if your patient is able to handle this progression, go ahead and work in square drawing. Uh, with those opposite arm and leg holds, I found that this will turn into a circle pretty fast with fatigue. And then you can also advance to standing pal-off presses, which can be incorporated, incorporated with these side steps followed by rotations as the space starts to incorporate movement. It's super important to remember general rules that you must be able to prevent movement before you are training to produce it. This can uh, be completed with any type of band or cable. In addition, single leg deadlifts are very challenging when done correctly and great to start incorporating at this phase, making sure they're maintaining that neutral position. In addition to resistive hip extension, it's another exercise that we commonly see done incorrectly with a lot of that hyperextension at the lumbar spine. The advanced phase of the Swiss ball is next, starting in a supine with the feet on the ball and bridging, progressing potentially to unilateral and incorporating movement, another great hamstring exercise. We'll use this down the road with our ACLs. In addition, alternating lower extremity motions can take place with a bridge, with the back on the ball here. Marches are gonna be easier than the extension that gets attempted. In prone, we get into some great exercises. All these prone exercises demonstrate very high EMG activity of the entire core. Here we have the pike. It's very uh, important to make that muscle-mind connection with this exercise that you are pulling from the core. Your feet should just kind of be floating on the ball towards you. We have the crunch. That last little inch where you're bringing those knees up is going to be important to really facilitate the core. We have the skier, which is knees to opposite elbow. You will definitely feel the obliques with this one.
In addition, we have decline push-ups on the ball when compared to performing off the ball. Demonstrate higher trunk, flexor, and extensor EMG activity. You should be staying in neutral. You should be lowering everything together with this. Prone planks can be performed on the ball with lower extremity movement. You can also uh, progress to rollouts at further distances. Side planks can be advanced with arm and leg motions here. And that ball is propped up against the wall. Lastly, light weight or squares can be added to bird dogs over the Swiss ball. Once your patient has progressed through core stability and anti-movement based drills, dynamic drills are incorporated such as the farmer's carry, the racked carry, and the Turkish get up. Furthermore, it's important to incorporate those multi-planar rotational movements for some athletes. These exercises work on incorporating movements through the hips and thoracic spine and will help teach the athlete core control when going from one position to another. These exercises can be done also by the non-rotational sport athlete depending on the function of your patient. This is where you can get into those landmine rotations or the sledge hammer hits. Further exercises to progress onto for power development include medicine ball chops and throws, kettlebell swings, rotational press and working into Olympic lifts as well as plyometrics with special consideration on how the athlete is controlling the core throughout. It is crucial to assess your athlete's form and core control when performing strength and plyometric programs in order to ensure carryover to daily training regimens. Here we just have the medicine ball chops. In conclusion, it's important to train each athlete for the unique needs of their position. However, starting with foundational movements may be necessary. And remember, the ability to resist motion is needed before training to produce it. This presentation outlines some examples using mainly a Swiss ball and body weight, but there are a lot of different options out there to keep athletes challenged and engaged. And lastly, take your core programs one step further and assess mechanics with sport-specific motions and training regimens. Not only will this assist with maintaining core strength, but will hopefully set your athlete up for less injury of risk <coughs> not only throughout their athletic career, but beyond that. Thank you.